Great, um, or, I, I don't care if anyone just wants to ask a question. I mean, they can interrupt and ask a question. For me, it doesn't have to be in the chat. Just whatever you want. No, I, I think to keep it in, in, in a little bit of structure, we're going to put them in the chat and I will fire away. I will monitor the chat. Um, as mentioned, this is recorded. I will put it on uh, YouTube on a hidden page so everybody can ask me the link. Of course, you will receive the footage as well um, to share to your own uh, liking. Um, all I know, we're good to go, uh, Coach. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, I'll speak on just some different concepts and tactics in terms of attacking uh, pick and roll switching defense, just different things that I've seen. In this clinic, it's it's just a bunch of ideas. Uh, it's not going to be something. Everything isn't going to apply to every team with every roster, with every construction. You know, the goal is that you pick up one or two thoughts that you can use uh, and apply to you and your team on, on just different ways to do it. Obviously, to attack switching, there's a bunch of different concepts and, and things that you can work on in skill work. Some of that stuff I won't cover, uh, like slips, offensive rebounds, et cetera. You know, these will just be some, some of the different things that are maybe a little bit underutilized or maybe some different ideas that I've seen uh, internationally and in the NBA uh, that I like, that, that I find interesting. Uh, starting out in, in the first few things that, that we'll talk about are things that apply to every pick and roll defense, right? So it doesn't matter if you're playing against a hard show, switch, drop, ice. Uh, ice is a little bit different because it's use a screen instead of reject the screen, but the, the concept is the same. Regardless of what you're playing against, right, rejecting the screen works against every pick and roll defense, you know, and it's something that you can consistently work on in your skill work, right? And as we've talked about before, if defenses are built and as coaches, 95% and for a lot of coaches, 100% of the time as we're working on our team pick and roll defense, it is based on uh, guys using the screen, right? So that means our defense is not prepared for failure. It's not built for failure. And the more that you reject the screen, the more that you're going to put teams in rotations that they haven't practiced and that you're going to put them in position to draw fouls, get layups, and get threes. Next thing that I think is underutilized in terms of pick and roll and under taught, which once again applies to every pick and roll coverage, Okay, our pick and roll setups, right? In, in terms of really coming in, creating that separation, whether it's attempting to reject the screen and they play good defense. Now, as you get to the point of the screen, you've come to separation. And something that I think is under talked about and oftentimes under taught is creating separation into the pick and roll, right? And obviously, one great way to do that is your different pick and roll setups, right? And, and once again, these are against all different types of uh, pick and roll coverages, right? And so at, at any point, if you can get to the point of the screen with that much separation between you and your defender, right? The defense is now gonna be at a disadvantage. And that's something that we gotta think about consistently. How do we put the defense in a disadvantage? And I think as coaches, we have to think about it from a skill work standpoint, a conceptual standpoint and a tactical standpoint in terms of our play calls. So some of these writers just pick and roll rejects, do a good job, get to the point of the screen, separation is created, which is now gonna oftentimes force the big to overcommit, right? Or defend it more aggressively or for you to help from different points uh, within your, your defense. So this is just something, once again, it gets the skill work and here you can watch Pangos and something so small, watch the way he jabs with his left foot, right, just to get that little bit of separation before the screen. And so there's different kind of pick and roll setups, obviously uh, triple threat setups, live ball hesitations. Here, Jacobin Brown, who played for us in Jerusalem, you can just see the way that he just bang, hesitates, opens up his hips, right? And at this point, you don't know, is he going to use the screen, reject the screen? And that little bit of hesitation is going to force his defender, right, to think, which is going to uh, really put him in a disposition. 
Uh, those are all side pick and roll setups. These are high pick and roll setups, just different kind. Once again, attempting to reject the screen. You know, I think is really effective. And, and that's why I think like, you know, as we've talked about and, and different coaches have talked about, right, your first option in any pick and roll is to reject the screen. And worst case, you have a better angle, better setup going into, uh, going into your pick and roll, right? And then here, just different triple threat setups, your different jab, shot fakes, you know, to once again, create that separation into the screen. And so I think this is got to be things that are really worked on and talked about in your skill work because they apply to every pick and roll defense. Next is now the, the conceptual tactical part for how do you create separation into the pick and roll. So we've got our different play calls or, or different actions where you just dead sprint off it, you know, to come to that point of the pick and roll with the separation. Your different uh, stagger handoffs, right? So here, like a stagger handoff to get that separation or a back screen to get that separation. Your different spinulous actions to get to the point of the pick and roll with your separations. You know, it's something that, that I think we've got to continue to evolve. And obviously high level teams in, in Europe are doing a great job and coaches are doing a great job. I just think for the most part, maybe it's under taught, under talked about on how to get that. And, uh, you know, on the NBA side, I thought Miami did a really good job in the playoffs with all of their different chase, zoom, stagger handoff actions of, of getting to the point of the pick and roll with that separation. You know, nice action now gets to right play calls to where you've got all this different kind of movement forcing that defender now being held, come off the, you know, I call it a pistol action, whatever your terminology is to once again, get it. Next concept that applies to attacking all pick and roll defenses are just off ball cuts. You know, whether it's your 45 cut baseline cut, you know, I think continuously trying to attack pick and roll coverages, depending on where they help from, whether it's your next style coverage, right, or teams that are heavy nail teams and how you want to cut and attack it, whether it's a sacrificial cut that opens up wide open shots for your team, right, or, or that middle penetration baseline cut. For me, I personally uh, prefer the rule of middle penetration equals baseline cut, Baseline penetration equals 45 cut, uh, especially with the way a lot of the defenses are built with their low man, uh, with their low man tactics. But I think it's something that, you know, I, especially at the G League, uh, obviously in, in Europe is, is much better at these type concepts, but, you know, some things that I've got to figure out how to get my players focusing on more, you know, really cutting that defense with a purpose, you know, and understanding how to cut, where to cut, where the weakness is, how you crack the defense and crack their defensive foundation just with these off ball cuts. And so here's just, you know, obviously at the NBA level and, and for teams that try to play that low man and then uh, here with your, your X out guys, he begins to fan. I'm a massive fan of the baseline drive 45 cut uh, or kill cut, whatever your terminology is. Okay, next concept, once again, obviously in Europe, you know, and, and it's uh, really well taught, but it's just something I, I think goes to every pick and roll foundation you know, attacking any kind of defense with any off ball movement of your different fill behinds cuts is super effective. And, uh, you know, consistently at, at the NBA level, the G League level, the predominant defense is your, your drops, your switches. And as you're thinking about how to get your players to attack the drop pick and roll coverage that's trying to solve it two on two, without over helping uh, from the other three defenders. Obviously, as we know, getting guys to be engaged and focused defending the ball for 24 seconds is incredibly difficult, let alone off the ball. You know, so these are just concepts that, that I've spent a lot of time focusing on and trying to prepare videos for 
you know, for my own team. And obviously the, the Euro League and high level Europe, they do such a good job with all of these off ball movements, fill behinds, you know, and it's, it's taught really well at some different countries throughout Europe. I think it's something that, that can continuously be focused on because it applies everywhere and against every pick and roll defense for the most part, you know, just to consistently think about shifting the defense, distorting the shell, filling behind, cutting. And it's even switching, right? Because everyone is always worried about and it's something we'll get into, uh, you know, oftentimes attacking through the advantage in the switch, right? Because everyone's going to be watching the ball. Next thing I, I really think is continuously underutilized is twisting and flipping screens. I think some teams are really good at it, but as a whole, it's probably not utilized enough. And, and once again, it applies to every coverage, you know, whether you're going to switch, drop, show, hard show, flat show, ice, you know, continuously flipping and twisting screens is, is extremely difficult to guard. You know, and if you think about it, how often do we work against that in practice? This is actually one of my favorite sets for it. So if anyone wants to steal a set, this is something uh, Neptunus ran against us in, in Champions League. I thought it was really effective uh, in terms of an action for, you know, last, whatever, end of quarter uh, situations if you want to try to run it. But, you know, really how often do we practice uh, against it? Seals, uh, you know, I'll say this, and, and a lot of this is that the Europe is still playing a lot through the post. The G League and the NBA has gotten away from playing through the post, and a big part of that is the analytical reason. And, you know, talking with our analytics department last year in New Orleans, you know, I, I told them to, to take a look at two things. One, points per possession in the post against a mismatch, so a big against a guard, and two points per possession in the post off a deep catch, off a seal. And because the, the mentality that a post-up play is a bad play is not accurate, right? A, a post-up play off the block against a like-sized player is a bad play, but both of those type of plays where it is a mismatch or a deep catch is over 1.0 points per possession. And it's something I, I think, once again, different coaches do a really good job uh, from Fenerbahce's Algoris. I think on Andrea Trinchetti's teams and, and Bomberg were excellent at, at getting those deep seals and that great position and, and high lows. And it's something that, you know, once again, can be taught to attack all uh, pick and roll coverages and sealing off for finishes, sealing off of the deep catch, hard show. You know, I think this is something really sealing the show, you know, and, and the different ways to do it can be done and skill work and be very effective. At the G League, hardly anyone seals, you know, same in the NBA, not a whole lot of teams are, are really trying to seal the drop, seal the show, seal the switch as much. Okay, now we're getting to the some of the skill work concepts in, in terms of guards, right? So like number one in terms of what we do in our skill work, and I'll just give you guys a, a few things of how we attack the switch, what we do with the different NBA players that I've worked with in my career, preparing them for the draft, preparing them during the season, and then the different teams I've worked with. Obviously, number one is just using speed, right, and attacking that hip, you know, going directly at that hip. You know, it's just something that is very effective in terms of drawing fouls, you know, whether it's against a slower, weaker defender. Next, against hesitations. You see all the times big guys fall for hesitation. So coming off against that switch, just that little hesitation that you're going to get into your pull-up dribble, you know, a few ways with your guards on things that you can work on. And it's just different guards, different teams. You know, of, of clips that I've cut up throughout the years of the effectiveness of utilizing that hesitation and utilizing at different points, whether it's on the perimeter, right, or in the paint, then your typical Tony Parker action where you're attacking that switch, backing it up, 
and then now getting downhill with pure speed, just flying at that defender. You know, once again, this, this gets to when I think of how to teach and how to teach better, you know, skill work, concepts, tactics. And uh, next is we talked about rejecting the screen, now rejecting the switch, right? Mm -hmm. So right as they're switching out, whether it's a show, they're hard showing into a switch or not, you know, rejecting the switch is probably something across the board that is underutilized. And once again, when teams switch, when you're working on your switching defense, how often are you practicing somebody rejecting the switch? And how is your defense built? Do your players know how to rotate against this? Really good effective. And if you see in a lot of these clips, minor teaching points of attacking the hip, right? Guys are going, if you take a look at a lot of these clips, and you think about hip attacks in terms of general at any point of attack, whether you're beating a guy off the bounce, attacking a closeout, as we know, most guys, right, their first step is not toes to the rim, foot to the rim. It's a really good point of emphasis in terms of taking scoring angles. Okay, boomerang, this is on here. Everyone, you know, everyone kind of utilizes the boomerang. Uh, but just to have the concept in case there happens to be any coaches that, that didn't, right, obviously your, your entire theory, which the boomerang is often misused, right? So you, the whole point is now that this defender is in help and now you've put him in a closeout situation or on the pass back, bang, you're catching and going. You're attacking the catch to get downhill, right? And oftentimes what you see when teams run boomerang is the guard gives it up and he'll get it back. And then he's just sitting there dribbling in place three, four times, and then attacking the big, which takes away the entire purpose and advantage of that boomerang of playing off the catch. You know, but I, I see a lot of teams that, that run the boomerang and then the guard gets it back and he's dribbling three, four times and he's dancing with it when the purpose is to attack that catch by putting the big in a closeout situation. Uh, in Jerusalem, my first season there, I worked for Simone Pianjani and I, I, I worked in Jerusalem for two different coaches, Simone and Oded Kates, who's currently the head coach there. And they both had different philosophies in attacking the switch. And what Simone wanted to do was uh, a lot of teams obviously switch with the four. So he wanted to provoke the switch with the four and then bring the five to the pick and roll to now make it a four five uh, in that pick and roll, which right, obviously they're going to miscommunicate it. They're not going to execute it, whether you're an early veer switch team, whatever it is, that was the way that, that Simone was really big on attacking the switch and it was really effective for us in Jerusalem. And it was a big concept and the way that we tactically prepared for an opponent, he would base the play calls off that. You know, having his play calls that had a pick and roll with the four first and then bringing a five to the pick and roll right, and then betting that they're going to have a miscommunication, a breakdown, as opposed to having a guard and a big in it. Okay, now similar kind of to the boomerang concept, right, is provoking that switch and then driving the big. And what ends up happening, think about the way that you do your shell drill, think about the way that you work on your perimeter defense with your bigs, right? Bigs over help. It is in their nature to over help to try to block the shot, right? So now putting them in that help position and driving the big to create the three-point shot. And, and by the way, if any coaches are looking for a good game against switching, Olympiacos first Maccabi in the EuroLeague this year, excellent game. Uh, really, really, really good where they they attack switching in a bunch of different ways very effectively to beat Maccabi. It's a really good game to watch. But here you can see just driving the big, they tend to over help. Really good baseline cut here to open up that, the shift. But it's, it's a really good way as you're trying to attack the switch conceptually of putting that big in help and making them over help by attacking him and attacking the help defender.
And so same concept can be from the post, right? You'll see it, ball goes into the post, right? What do bigs do? Once again, okay, now they're worried about it. They just tend to overhelp because they're not in this position and our shell defense is probably enough and we don't work on not overhelping. And it's just in their nature, they wanna block everything. Goes in, over help a little bit, loses sight of the man on the relocation. Three. Now, another big concept that, that Simone talked about in Jerusalem was top shoulder screens. And so what he wanted to do to get to the point of the screen, okay, is to screen here with your right shoulder, right? Most of the time we talk about setting our hard physical screen, screening the, the middle third of the body, screening the lower third of the body, whatever your terminology is, splitting them with your screen, right? At the angle that forces them over. Simone was really big on top shoulder, right? Because if you think about what your switch rules are, talk it, touch it, grab it, switch it, right? switch on contact, no screen, no scheme, whatever terminology you use. He wanted the contact to be with the top shoulder so the guard couldn't switch under. And then now he's on your high side for the high low. And that was something really effective for us in, in the way that we attacked the switch. And like when we played Ulm against uh, Ulm at home in Euro Cup against Per Gunther, they were switching everything. That was a really effective way that we took it. But here you can just see the angle, right, of the screens that the bigs are setting to where they're screening them with that top shoulder, not really allowing the guards to get underneath, right, to stand up the roll. So that's a really good concept as with your big guys teaching them when you know that teams are screening, right, just even here, you know, just the simple tap, that simple contact, which is going to provoke the switch. You know, teaching your bigs when you know, watch the way he pushes his man down lower to set that lower screen, right, to really provoke that switch. I think it's very good. Off-ball flares, you know, this is something I personally will spend a lot more time focusing on. I, I talked about it last year with my team. But I would say as a whole, I didn't work on it enough, right? But again, switching, just off-ball flares, obviously, especially a lot of teams are going to switch with eight seconds or less. But setting your, your random off-ball flare screens, and, and you know, these are all from the same game, right? So the, as Finner's attacking, Zalgaris' switch, you know, they kind of carve it up just with these off-ball flares, It's, it's something I, you know, from the teams that I've seen in Europe, uh, Finner, Finner was the best, you know, just off ball flares. It was part of who they are, whether you were switching or not, they set a lot of off ball flares, but it was super effective against switching. And obviously in, in that switching component, what ends up happening is everyone watches the ball and you can create a lot of those miscommunications and get your wide open threes, your wide open slips for layups. You know, this is something personally for me that I, I will, you know, one of these concepts that I'll take and, and spend a lot more time with my team on in terms of attacking switching. Next concept, and, and I thought this was one of the smarter things that I've learned this summer, uh, the Charlotte Hornets do this against the switch. Right, so what they'll do is they switch and get the big on the screen, okay? And now what they're gonna do is now run a slip pick and roll with the guard or go screen, whatever your terminology is, with the guard and the big. And what you're, you're thinking is why are you bringing a guard to the screen for the switch, right? But what ends up happening, and if you think about most of the time we work on the slip pick and roll, once again, whatever your terminology is, the typical horns with guard where he sprints up from the baseline, slips out off the flare, or the four man does it. Very rarely is the five on the ball. And he's almost never on the ball. So what they did is 
they attack the five with the slip. So here we'll get out to the slip because it's not the guard that's going to mess it up. It's going to be the five that opens up that pop, right? Guards are a little bit more prepared because we work on the guard, the guard slip, the ghost screen, right? But uh, Charlotte, I thought it was a really simple and basic concept that they did. And you can just see here, bigs continuously messing up the coverage because once again, they're not prepared for it because we don't work on it in practice. You know, I can say I've, I've never worked on it, having a guard, having a five-man guard the ball and then defend, uh, you know, that slip, pick, and roll. You know, There's just a lot of miscommunications with it. Coach, I saw that there was a question. Yeah, yeah indeed. There was a question. Does that um, second screen always have to come from the opposite corner or a wing or could it be any screen? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it could be anywhere in terms of where you're also opening up the driving gap for the guard to attack the wake. You know, so depending on, let's say it's, you, you've got to have the floor balance, right? Ideally where when whoever is coming to screen from that side now becomes a double gap where the ball handler can get downhill. Any other questions? Perfect. No, that was the that, that was the only question at the moment. So, looking great. Okay, the concept that Oded was really big on against switching as opposed to Simone. Simone was a little bit more attack the switch through the guard through the big tactically, isolate that guy and and try to attack him. To where Oded's philosophy is a little bit more like this here. He wants to attack it with flow and on the second side. And obviously, as, as we're switching defensively, our goal is to force the offense to become stagnant and to play isolation basketball, which even if you're playing against good isolation players, as we all know, the three players not involved in it uh, basically feel like they're not touching the ball, they're not getting the ball, and then maybe they don't defend as hard or bring the energy. And so Dead wanted to attack switching defense here. So not on the first side, because what ends up happening is this defender falls asleep, is attacking the switch on the second side. And so now you've gotten three, four players to touch the basketball, right? So now in this possession, two players have touched the ball. You've gotten back to it. The defense is shifting. He's setting the screen. He's involved. He's not just standing around, right? Now you attack the switch on the second side. Ideally, you know, as we're talking seals, he should just stop here, right? He should just stop point blank at the rim and it's over. You know, there's nothing that can be done for that. You know, but that's, that's the way that Oded's philosophy was different than Simone's on, on how he wanted to attack it was really very second side based. And, you know, both were successful. So this is us in Jerusalem, right? We prevent the provoke the switch, right? Now we've gotten three players that have touched in the ball. Ideally, once again, Josh Owens here should have a deep seal right there. He should have a deep seal against Hamilton. But you can see the concept of Oded didn't want to stop the flow of the offense to attack the switch. Everything with Oded against switching, it doesn't matter, is that the flow of the ball will find the mismatch. And that was Oded's philosophy. So same thing, just different clips, different teams doing a good job of keeping the ball moving, not become stagnant, keeping the flow, attacking the switch. Okay, and then now, you know, something I think is maybe the most effective way, an undertaught way to attack switching uh, is through the advantage. And so this is something uh, Demetrius Etudis did a clinic this summer that I was a part of, and I kind of prepared this video for the clinic he was doing. And I think one thing his teams do a really good job of is attacking the switch through the advantage, which is oftentimes not the guard or the big involved in the switch. It's one of the three players off the ball. And if we think about human nature, Right here, we've created the switch. And some of these clips are against teams that scram or triple switch, whatever your terminology is. And you can see a lot of these clips, and Coach Tudas talked about it, was in their skill work, they eye the big, they'll pass fake the big to draw the defender in. 
to draw the help and then play through the closeout. And I think conceptually, if we're thinking about it, right, like in terms of playing against switching defense, it's done, right? Like now it's a closeout. Now you've put them in rotations. And now it's just getting back to your concepts of creating the advantage, keeping the advantage, using the advantage. And I think oftentimes in switching, we want to create the advantage or our players want to create the advantage and use the advantage. They don't want to keep the advantage. These are just different ways. And what I've done in, in all of the, the stuff that I cut up is I have, and I recommend this to, to every coach that watches clips, right? Like I've got five folders. I've got a skill work folder, a concept folder, a playbook folder, a defensive folder, and then trash. And every clip that I watch goes into one of those five. And I've now got over 200 clips of teams, whether it's organically or tactically, attacking the switch through the help. And just all you see here, right, is Heinz rolling. He's pulled in. He's worried about helping. Advantage created. Play through the closeout. And I think sometimes against switching, we, we overcomplicate things where what ends up happening is the human nature someone's going to overhelp. Not all the time, right? But here we can just see it because small defender's on it. He's pulled in, defensive mistake, one of three guys off the ball, close out basketball. Coach, we've got some uh, coaches asking for you to repeat your five um, top folders. Sure. So I've, I've got a skill work folder, a concept folder, so like to me, skill work is anything that's more like one-on-one, one-on-oh, -on -one, one -on you know, like guards coming off a of pick and roll, making a pass, guards coming off a of pick and roll, scoring, guards coming off against undershot. Then I have a concepts folder, which involves two players. So like baseline drive, 45 cut, right? So to me, that's, that's a concept, right? It's not just skill work because it's not one-on-oh, -on -oh, it's involving two, three players. And that concept can apply to anything that you do. Penetration, pick and roll, post up, doesn't matter. It's something that kind of applies across the board, regardless of what your offensive philosophy is. Then I have a playbook folder for every situation, right? In the game, like if we want to, you know, go through ghost screens, different ways to get to your ghost screen, slip screen, shooting actions out of the post. You know, I label everything very detailed. Then I have a defensive folder. So different things that I see where plays don't work. Okay, why didn't it work? You know, different ways to defend the stack, pick and roll, and then trash can. So every clip I watch goes in one of those. You know, and I, and I try to, I wish it was something I started doing seven years ago uh, because I'd have even more stuff categorized and cataloged, but learn as you get older. Anything else? I see one uh, coming up. Which concept do you give uh, to your team about who cuts on the pick and roll? Or is it based on um, who your opponent is? Uh, so it's based on two things. One, the, the conceptual side, team rules, middle penetration, baseline cut, baseline penetration, 45 cut. And then it will go to the tactical side of, let's say you're, you're hard showing in a pick and roll. Right. So I got, let me see if I can quickly uh, pull this up because then I can just show it. Uh, let's see. And so I, I, I think like if you're attacking the, the hard show, I think one of the best uh, ways to attack it is to attack it with an angle pick and roll or elbow pick and roll, depending on your European or American terminology, right? So as you attack it with your angle, elbow, pick and roll, you just short roll that guy, baseline cut, uh, and then drop the guy from the 45 down to the corner. And it's super effective. Um, you know, I'm trying to say I got a bunch of clips somewhere on this in my concept folder. Uh, and so to me, I, I think that is a a very effective way to to really attack it, um, you know. So then, once again, that goes to the to the concept side of it. 
you know, like how do you want to attack uh, each thing that you do? This is here. This is a good clip. Let me just pull this up. All right. So here's just a clip of Seska. So like this is the the tactical side of it of playing that angle pick and roll. Can everyone see this? Is that clear? So playing that angle pick and roll, short roll, right? And the way that teams have to help off the show, baseline cut, you know, and taking advantage of that. So for me, that's, you know, it falls a little bit in the concepts, right? Because this is basically middle penetration, baseline cut. But for me, it goes conceptual to tactical. And so that's, you know, this is the concept that I use in the G League this year. If you were going to hard show against us, this is the floor balance we went to, you know, and I'll say like with Simone, Simone was very big on floor balance. He was going to organize the plays that we were going to attack you with based on the floor balance he thought was best to attack your pick and roll coverage. And, you know, for me, like this is one of the best floor balances to attack the hard show or a flat show. And it's, it's incredibly, if you're going to hard show or flat show, you know, understanding what plays you have and what they're most effective attacking in terms of your coverage. Like for me, I have a switch package. If you're going to switch against us, I've got my five set plays that I'm going to go to to attack your switch. You want to show against us, I've got my show package. You want to drop against us, I've got my drop package. Then on top of that, it's a conceptual thing. Uh, sorry, now I've got 100 things pulled up. Yeah. Okay. So same thing, playing, playing through the advantage, right, of guys that are just going to overhelp in some way, shape, or form. And once again, you can, you can see here, and, and Coach Ketutis talked about this, right, like they eyed the big. They really eye it to sell it, and they work on a lot of pass fakes against the big, and then bang, attacking that closeout. So same thing, they eye, really sell it, pass fake, tack the closeout. And I thought it was something, you know, something I just kind of noticed uh, organically, and it's something that, you know, that I think is super effective in, in getting guys to read the three off-ball players not involved in the switch. And whether you want to throw it into the post, same thing, right, like, Players oftentimes think playing against a switch that the mentality, when we talk about be aggressive against the switch means score, or when we say create against the switch means score, right? And I think players just, they don't understand when we say be aggressive, right? It means to force two on the ball, put the defense in help, find the player that's over helping, find and read the advantage. You know, and so here, Right, it's going to be off the dribble, and Nigel William Goss is watching the ball against the penetration. Right, the advantage is created. Now it's just your simple Maggetti cut. Well, same thing. You've got the switch, right? And if you just look, five guys standing watching the ball, slightly over helping. Put them in rotations. Yep. So, Coach, we got a question coming in the chat. Um, in each package, do you have the same initial formation? For example, box, diamond, Iverson, etc., to hide the actions, or do you use the same formation but different ending actions? Uh, so it depends on the team. Um, and in the G League, a lot of it is, you know, you're you're trying to. In the G League, it's different, right? Like you're trying to get your players to remember your own plays, you know, so it's it's a mentality to where everything is a little bit more, you try to keep it out of the same play. And in the G League, you, you stack your play calls, right? So you may have chase quick, chase quick step, chase quick dive, chase quick. And so it's all play calls and you're trying to teach them what 
you know, chase means, what quick means, what step means, what dive means, and then you stack the play calls together, right? Where obviously in, in Europe, it's a little bit more hand signal based because you can't hear everything. And, you know, so I, I've done it both ways. Uh, traditionally, I'm not worried about the same floor balance, you know, right? Like, uh, I'm not trying to, like, I have the Iverson package where I'm going to go Iverson into a punch, Iverson into a hammer, Iverson into, you know, your screen, the screener, you know, but I, I don't have it separated like that in my uh, switch package or show package. For me, that is more about plays that are effective in different ways I want to get it. Like, do I want to attack the switch through the post, through the guard, through the help, you know, and then it's a little bit more of you can control who's getting the ball and what the advantage is. So, and I think there's another question in, in your leading up to that question, actually. That question goes about if you know, if, for example, before the game, what they're going to do, for example, switching screens, do you decide which concepts you're going to use, what you just described? Or would you also let your players have some freedom on reading the situation and playing something different? So, so that's, you know, once again, that gets to the point of the skill work concept play call. So skill work is obviously something that they're going to recognize. Like if we're preparing, which I did it in Europe and I do it the same way in the G League, uh, if I know that you're going to switch on the pick and roll, we start out two on two in the pick and roll. Like this is how we'll warm up. Let's say we got a day before the game or it's a back to back and we just got to shoot around. We warm up big come in to set the screen in the pick and roll. First read guard rejects the screen scores guard rejects the screen, big dives guard hits the big guard uses the screen, rejects the switch score big slips the screen score. Big top shoulder, big score. Guard attacks the screen with speed, score. So I get through all of the, the skill work slash concepts to that. Then I had a third player, right? To now I use the screen, throw it ahead, triangle pass to the big, throw it ahead, boomerang back to the guard, throw it ahead, drive the big, hit the guard. And then I build it to four, then to five. So trying to teach them the proper skill work to attack individually then if the skill work isn't available the conceptual part for the boomerang that you know the the seal the uh drive the big right and then figuring out what i can recognize and utilize the play calls so let's say i see something specific in how to attack the switch i then can dictate that with my play calls so I try to have a combination because, right, like the ideal goal is that we're teaching players how to play, how to read the game, because then that applies for their whole career. Because if someone plays for me, I'm going to have my teaching points to come play for you. They're going to have, you're going to have your teaching points to go play for Alex. He's going to have his. But if I teach them how to read the game and play the game, he can take that and apply it to what you're teaching. He can take what you're teaching and apply it to what Alex is teaching and so on. Right. And then you can, you can basically in a sense, right. You can, you can compound information. You can save information right now. You always have data to pull from. And then I want it to where always as coaches, that's part of our value in terms of in games adjustments. I'm going to see things from a hole that they may not see. So I want to have the ability to specifically attack a specific player or a specific mismatch with the floor balance and the way that I want. So I dictate that with my play calls. Now, I try to teach the guards what the play calls are and who they want to play through and what the strengths are. But ultimately, I want to still have the right if they're not doing a good enough job reading it or attacking it either organically or conceptually that I can dictate it, if that makes sense. No, that makes perfect sense. And I think that's a great explanation all in all on, on how you do it at a top level. Uh, trying to get through this quick because obviously I'm hogging all of Alex's time. Uh, 
this is just something floor balance wise, right? When I talked about like floor balance on things with Simone, this is just something you can just tell that obviously this is a go-to floor balance for Finner against switching. You know, and here you can just kind of see all the different options they score out of and essentially the same floor balance when provoking the switch. All right, so switch, read for the high low, the flash. So you've seen them score through the post, through the high low. I got the flash, bang, boomerang, tack the catch. And then now you'll see it right, skip to the weak side. And so I'm like, I think this, this entire floor balance of the clips that you saw is a really good example of the skill work attacking through the post, the seal, what you're gonna do with the go-to. Okay, now the skill work on the boomerang, right? Attacking the closeout, the conceptual side, the high low, how to seal, how to get the high low, and then obviously the tactical side of, of utilizing that floor balance. Okay, last section I got. Okay, now when we get to some of the play calls, I, I'll say this. I, I think this is this is something Cody Topper runs. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know him, he was a head coach of the Naz Sun, assistant with the Phoenix Suns, and now assistant with the uh, Memphis University where Penny Hardaway is. I think this is one of the best plays I've seen, right? It's like here you can see off-ball switch. It, it kind of covers all different kinds of switch to attack the switch, provoke the switch, off-ball switch. And it is a, a play that I think is really effective. And, and what you're going to see here, right, is here you're, you're essentially provoking the switch, right? So there you've got it driving the big, forcing the big to over help, catch and shoot three. You know, and this is something I stole from him and ran this year. And so, like, this is trying to provoke the switch, right? So now here you provoke the switch, put the big in help. Now you're going to attack through the big. And so, I, like I said, I, I, I stole this and ran it. it was, this was part of my switch package, which was really effective. And, and really what you're trying to do is this, right? It's like you've created the switch. Now you're driving the big, ideally, and then you're attacking the closeout here. You know, and so you, you're trying to, to drive the nail through this concept. And you can do it either way, like you can dictate who you want, right? So if you saw the clip before, right, the guard went and set, set the screen to provoke that switch. But here, let's say you wanna attack the switch through the wing, same concept, right? Now you've got the wing instead of the point guard, you've got the early burn cut to open up the attack to catch concept, bang, now you get downhill. And so- we we got uh, we got two questions coming in. Um, first one: Why do you prefer cutting the corner three uh, on the three side as opposed to a forty-five cut? Wouldn't the forty-five take away the closest plugging help defender? On the I don't understand. I'm sorry. Oh, on the three side, if you so you're saying right here. Yeah, so um, if I'm correct, yes. But if the coach that asked the question in it, if he could reply if that's the case, but I'm imagining are, yes. Are you talking but, uh, about this floor balance where it cuts right here? Yeah. That's, but, that's um, the question was, why would you prefer to have the, the corner cutting? But I'm seeing only 45 cuts. Yeah, I didn't. I, he, can he ask the question? You care if he actually asks the question? Because I want to answer. I just don't know what the yeah. Means it was the ball screen. Outside or Hank. If the ball screen is an empty wing ball screen, he's asking. Yeah. What about it? Why do I want to cut which flare? He mentioned the corner. Yeah, on the middle penetration. Uh, the weak side three of us played our space the way. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, so typically, right, like as, as we're talking conceptually, for me, if you're going against this, the three side to cut the corner on the penetration is different than, say, on that pass ahead, right? So, like, if I'm penetrating, 
what ends up happening is what's your low man going to do? You know, so, like, if, if I come off an empty corner pick and roll, let me just get the whiteboard so we can talk through it effectively. Okay, so this is the situation he's asking. Is that correct? I'm waiting on his reply. Yes, correct. Okay, so here's why I prefer to cut the baseline guy as opposed to the middle guy in this situation. Number one, this screen <clears throat> to me should be lower. All empty corner pick and rolls should be set lower but it doesn't really matter. And the reason why I want them set below the 45 is because you're gonna stress and stretch your nail defender and your low man, right? So in this situation, as the guard is coming off and your five is rolling, right? On that early cut, this guy's worried about the penetration, right? So you have this cut a little bit more. If he cuts, you're right in the line of the penetration, as opposed to where if he cuts here, He's behind the defense, so he's not, he's not clogging up the penetration based on the guard. Does that make sense? And so now from here, you've got a few things to think about. One, he can penetrate, begin to cut, and always go back. you got this shot. Two, which you're going to get a wide open three if you do this. So for anyone that wants a wide open three, I guarantee it. Okay, you come off the screen, X2 is going to be here, bang, you're rolling, X5 is rolling. If you cut the baseline, X2 is going to stay there on the penetration. X5 is here. Now you turn this into a baseline screen all the way to the corner, and you hit that, that's going to be naked. If he cuts here, he's in the way. He jams all this penetration. Next thing. I'm forcing two defenders to shift and to keep their head on the swivel. As he cuts, right, now it's going to open up this. He gets to shift. He gets to shift. Now X4's got to make a decision. X3's got to make a decision, right? If he stays home on the shift, he opens, he helps swing, swing corner three. He rotates down, he rotates down, he cuts through, penetration is open, there's no one there to help on the gap. If he stays home but he falls asleep, now you've got your corner. So that's for me, that's my own personal preference. Now, on the throw ahead, this is a different situation. On your typical throw ahead, now if you want to cut this guy because now he can drive the angle that he's driving he's cleared but if you drive from this angle he's in your way this is now filled thanks for that explanation coach no problem okay now this is once again just just the play that just different options out of the play. Like I said, it's, I think it's a great play to attack switching. And the fact that you can dictate if you want who you want to attack that closeout, your your guard or your, your point guard or your two right, whoever the better guys that you have attacking the closeouts is good. Now, if you've got a five that can handle and decision make, now this is a great option out of it, right? Bang. Hard to guard. Lots of really good options to attack different switches. And then here's a clip. The Charlotte Hornets stole the same concept uh, from Cody. You know, just with the same, same kind of concept and mentality. Okay, some other sets that I've seen that I like against switching right here. 
right? This this angle of this step up, once again, the angle of the screen, I, th I think that's just it's hard to switch on and to get under. Uh, Zalgaris ran this against Olympiakos. Uh, did a lot of off-ball switching. Now, if you actually watch Maccabi, uh, they run this same action uh, to attack switching now after uh, they – carved them up on every different option. This play is also in my personal switch package. You know, and so what I do in this set, I dictate who this is. So like for me, this is Horns, name of the player I want to set the screen, Horns Javon, Horns Aubrey, Horns whoever. And so that's, that's kind of how it dictates who's setting that screen to bring the weaker defender to the ball. But for me, it's, you know, I, I like this set. For, it's been effective uh, for me. And obviously, you know, there's some really good clips of Maccabi running it uh, as well. I thought it was just effective set, effective action against it. You know, and that's just kind of the continuation. Another set against teams that you know are going to try to switch, right? Bang, you got that slip to a deep duck in. Thought that was a nice play. Okay, and then that's different. Whole different clinic there on attacking drop, but Alex, sorry. <laughs> oh man, that was awesome stuff. Perfect. Yeah. Let's go right into it, Alex. All right, let me share my screen. Great. First up, welcome guys. Great to see uh, a lot of uh, friends on the call. So I'm going to take some of the things that some of the great stuff we just saw from Ryan and just show different ways we can develop that in, in the practice environment. Uh, this is what we're going to cover. So we're going to look at the non-linear approach to pick and roll uh, and how this kind of uh, the traditional approach would vary with more of a constraints led approach. I'm going to focus on showing how we can develop setups, some static one-on-one, -on -one, the boomerang and the mayday concept that, that Ryan showed. And then just looking at how we can, uh, we can develop it, like I said, in the practice environment and ensure that it's retained when it comes to the game. Now, what nonlinear means, and this, a lot of this comes from uh, the ecological approach, constraints that approach to, uh, to coaching is, starting with the challenge first and and mike spoke about this I, I see i saw mike was on the call um mike spoke about this on the cross canada call uh clinic sorry when when he spoke about the three stages explore exploit and execute and i can't remember what what uh book that came from but essentially it means i'm starting we're starting with the challenge and we're giving the players in the context of pick and roll we're setting them up with the task as opposed to going in immediately and giving them explicit instruction. So we're going to start with that. Then we go to the exploit stage and this is where we problem solve and I work backwards from what I see in that explore. So it's looking at what things do they need the most and that will happen through a debrief and then the execute is maybe we go back to the same game or a different game and we're looking for the retention from what we've seen in exploit um, to be withheld in the chaos of the game. Now, I've got Christopher Columbus here, the, the famous explorer. And this is where the, the self-discovery stage is, is really important. Um, so in the context of topics, say it's pick and roll against a switch, I would just start the players 3v3, maybe give them a loose spacing template to play with, such as maybe a shakes type pick and roll with a, a single side backside. Give the constraint that the defense can only switch and then see what happens. And it's messy learning, but we're seeing what they can self-discover first. Because every time, and this is very applicable to, to other, you know, skills in basketball, but every time we, we rob players of a natural solution, it's less effective for the long-term transfer. Now, when I'm doing this, I will just dictate what some of the constraints are. So I'm just going to play this video. Shout out to uh, 
Lorenzo, the coach in this from college. I, I you saw can Lorenzo only on switch. That's the only coverage. So here I'm just giving the constraint as to what the coverage is, and they're just playing. And you can see it's messy. Wrong decisions. You can see, obviously, missed that throwback pass right there. But I'm just seeing the level of the group, too, especially if I'm working with a new team. This really allows me to see what they need the most. And you can see there a great solution this player automatically doing the slip. And that's something we'd make sure to praise mm, within that. You can see they're keeping that defend on the high side. And this is Dude, all go, stuff go, they go, just keep it, keep it. discovered, go, did themselves. Go, go. Now I've just loaded in, it's 3v3v3. Three, three, three. So I like to get out the half court pretty quickly and create more of an environment, which is task representative. That means reflective of 5v5. Five and a lot of the time when we put start drills in perfect spacing, it's just not realistic. So immediately we're seeing if they can recreate that shakes, pick and roll spacing with a transition trip and then just see what they do to play against the switch. And we just got to be comfortable with the mess here. They're wobbling, let them figure it out, etc. And this whole process might only take four minutes. And we'll just start with this right at the beginning of practice. Then what we do is getting everyone in. Very good. Shake, like James Bond. Shake and not stir. Now we're going to start by looking at different ways that we can beat the switch coverage. What we can do is the ball handler to beat the coverage. So you, you can see there, we're just doing a little debrief. And what that debrief would look like is something like this. And this is something... Um, I read in, in Japan about how they, uh, how they problem solve, especially, specifically what they do in maths classes. And it's called Bansho. And it's basically this, this process of problem solving, debriefing as a group. I've learned a lot about debriefs from Mike, and it, that's really, really helped. And I think it's so important with players, especially when you're dealing with a, a topic like pick and roll, which has such great complexity. So some of the questions, and it's different questions every time, otherwise they get bored. But we could ask things like, you know, what do we, what did we discover in that in that game? What were some things we found difficult? And we could, we will just write them on a whiteboard. And it could be things that didn't work. It could be things that worked. And and now we start to get an idea from the group, and it's more athlete centered. So then we can we can really figure out what solutions we need. Now it's from this that we go to the exploit stage, and this is typically the small sided games where we're more looking at building some of these specific solutions which which ryan just presented and as i do this just it's important to have uh, an understanding of the definition basic skill acquisition concepts this being the concepts of motor performance and motor learning and the way i'm going to teach this is not going to be a blocked typical one on zero two on zero approach because i really want these solutions to to be withheld when it comes to 5v5 so i'm looking to train players in a way which will lead to long-term uh, changes in their motor learning and it will stay long term as opposed to being able to do it in a practice session but then it doesn't hold up uh, when it gets to the next practice or the next game so how how i would start looking at some of the setups is we can see this is just a uh, 1v1 plus one plus one being the screener i typically just start this with a drag and we just focus on screener can arrive alone with a quick change of speed go head on the rim then then veer off look at the look at the screening angle there um, and the defender X1 is going to be a guided defender. So they've got three options. I talk about the menu of options, and this is what I, I use to help kids understand. It's because it's, it's quite a difficult concept, especially for pros even, to get this idea of what guided means. So it's, it's for the benefit of the offense, but also defensively, it's, it's great in terms of being able to learn, especially when it comes on to other coverages, things you can do to be disruptive. So it's a great way to learn both defense and offense. And the cues I'm going to give, they've got to imagine they're, they're at a restaurant and they're a waiter and they're making, uh, they're going to the diner giving a recommendation off the menu. And it's either A, B, or C. So we stay for three reps, but every rep, it's a different letter. It's randomized. They don't know what they're going to get. Option A would be the defender gives their positioning to cue an early reject, but then they're trying to recover. So that means typically use a cross step or hip turn. So like I said, getting in that defense and they're trying to contest, get back to neutral. So there's somewhat of a contested finish still. 
the late reject. So if, if the player does their setup dribble, they don't get that window for the early reject. But then as they go to use the screen, X1 beats them, arrives before them, then they may have that late reject opportunity. And option C, you can see on the right, that could be anything. It could be, I, I put steal the under as an example in here. So then the screener gets that decision to twist. Uh, but it could be something else like a bingo. I picked that up from Zico uh, or just forcing them over. Now, what this looks like in practice, I did this to start with. I didn't have a player as the screener. This was brand new for these guys. And I just really wanted all their focus of attention to be on those reads. So that was the late reject I gave. So you can see they're going for their setup. That was, I did this with the bingo. So I just left the gap before. And these reads are exaggerated as I start. And then they become more subtle as we go. There I force the over. So this is the idea from Bernstein of repetition without repetition. I don't want players to always know what, what they're going to have. I want this to be random practice. I want high levels of contextual interference. Now you can see here, that's kind of giving that window for the reject. And we, I want that player to be able to take that kind of skate dribble and just go if they see a window without the need to take this extra dribble, which you see right now, because then that defender can just recover back to neutral. And you can see now I'm just changing the location. So exactly the same concept, just to make the practice more random, more variable, changing locations frequently. And this is a lot of wobbling. It's not perfect by any means, really not perfect. But you can see it just get, they get more and more comfortable with it. Now I'm just gonna go to the other side. Now I'm loading in some extra cues. So if I really jam and get up close to them, they've got to kind of use that hip turn protect and it's the same cues. And this is where having a defender is so important because then they figure out the solutions. And I'm not giving them a perfect motor pattern on the reject. I'm not saying this is how you must reject. They self-discover and figure it out. And because I'm close here, that crossover is not going to be a solution on the reject. And they figure that out without me telling them and without me even having to give that feedback because the next rep, he does something different. And this is just, you know, implicit learning. They're learning through my positioning as the defender and the guides I'm giving. And they weren't necessarily super aggressive with their setup, setups here, but this is the first time we looked at decisions. And now it's a lot, lot smoother just after time doing this. Now, off the catch, a really nice example here. Ryan showed some great clips too. You can also think about how you can do that guided. Typically, you could do something like, if the defender bites like that, you got the reject. If the defender stays, use the screen. If the defender tries to go under early, shoot. So it's just, when I watch clips now, I'm really looking, I'm watching the clips but then thinking, how can I incorporate this into my player dev and come up with the, with the guides, which, which make it more relevant. Um, now, incorporating the screener. So exactly the same ABC cues for X1. Now we've got the player, uh, five, come, five man coming in as the screener. Now, he could kind of do a curved roll to give one space and he could clean up the miss if there is one or he might wish to pop so that if X1 is able to neutralize one and recover, five's got that shot. And what I like doing is once the players can do those ABCs fairly well, I do three reps, but every three rep is a new location. So we're not staying in, on the same uh, spot. So you can see it might be an elbow prick and roll on the left. Um, that's, I, I got a lot of this terminology from Zico on the, Zico Coronel on the masterclass. He did with immersion, some really good stuff. Um, then a reverse screen. Some, that was some, uh, Moncho Fernandez. He calls that a reverse, like a step up. And then it could just be a chase action, but obviously there's unlimited things you could do just to add more rand randomness. And what this does is it really, at first it really disorientates the players just being in a different spot, even though it's the same ABC reads. And again, this is making it more, more random, more likely to be withheld when it comes into the game. Now, loading up to 2v2. On a switch coverage, if there's a reject, typically it's gonna be much harder to, uh, to neutralize one. Sometimes against the drop, they might be able to uh, like emergency switch via switch it. But um, I just now adding this extra defender for some more context. You could also make it a 2v3, putting a defender in the smile, um, especially on those setups that you saw very quickly I would progress to having a defender in the smile so that they have an extra decision on the finish. So it's a primary decision on the, on the setup, a secondary decision at the rim. But obviously that's a higher cognitive load, takes up more of the working memory. So I don't always start like that. Um, 
Something you could also do on this is add in um, a weak side read. We saw what Ryan showed with the seeing where the advantage is, is especially if the low man gets pulled across really deep. So typically, if I don't have an extra player, if it's a small group, sometimes what I will just do is stand on the weak side corner and put my hands up. And then one has to make the skip. I could give it early, really early, and they've got to throw it immediately. I could give it on time or I could give it late as they're rejecting or I might not give it at all and that just develops that concept of player one scanning the floor seeing the floor in 3d if I receive it then they have to get open for it again and if it's neutral they have to uh using some of the efficient source terminology record scratch reignite run another trigger in this case a pick and roll see if they can start dominoes you know find an advantage again this is what some of the 2v2 stuff looks like and you can see here problems and I'm not coaching this immediately. I'm just letting them play through it. And then we will talk about the solutions debrief. And sure enough, then they come up with some better solutions, just, just playing 2v2. And I'm doing static starts on here. That means I'm starting in, perfect location, in a perfect location just because with these reads alone, they were finding it challenging. I would progress to the more dynamic stuff once they can do this at a reasonable success. And you can see even very high level players here struggling with decisions, finding rob shots, range open on balance, etc. But that's the end of quarter one. Just reflective task if you want. You can just think of a way you can load some of that stuff. I'd love to hear any of your feedback. If you have any ideas on different constraints you might use, things you'd change, please do let me know. I'd love to hear. Now, we also might deload. And if they're really struggling with this, we might have no decisions and just choose one A, B, or C option. And that's what I call scripted. So we could deload and go from guided to scripted. But then I would challenge the players by to increase more random, to have more random practice. I would say, can you reject it potentially a different way for all three reps? And I would still have X1 there. So there's some type of cue just so they know where they have to reject in terms of ball placement and they can feel a body there. Now I would also incorporate the golden snitch, which I have right here. And Obviously, I see Mike on the call. We've spoken a lot about this. Um, the original idea came from Ross McMaines. He uses the snitch as double points if you get if you get that player, I think, mean, open for a score, they start a score. I, uh, Mike and I use this to really reinforce behavior over outcome. So we would be competing, say it's, we're competing within the small-sided game. Normal scores or could be a special point system. But the golden snitch is a specific task. So say, for instance, on this reject, if, if the X4 defender goes to help or is in a low position and player one is able to make, I don't know, it could be a one-handed kick out, no look, that could be the golden snitch for the situation. And it's really fun. The players love it with their pros or, or young kids and it develops creativity because otherwise, if, if you just compete, then players won't try new things because typically there's some type of consequence or punishment for the loss. So just being creative with the manipulation of constraints to encourage new behaviors forming. And you can just see this. I really exaggerated the read. This was actually, uh, I, I was doing, uh, we were doing touch screens here, but I'm really, really exaggerating it to begin with. And like I said, eventually that becomes more subtle. What I would do on this now is get a second basketball in. This isn't very time on task because it's just one player out of five getting a shot. So now I would have a ball and throw it in so I get, can finish with a second 2v2 of some type of uh, pick and roll action. Now, stages of retention. Static starts is just where we start, start exactly wherever we're setting the pick from. Dynamic starts are better for retention. And this is where we have some movement to get into it. And that's what we're going to look at next. And, uh, you know, talk, so speaking with Mike, got a lot from Mike in terms of especially teaching off inbounds actions. And a dynamic start is basically... Can they recreate that same situation but with more chaos while being pressured or bumped a little bit more? So maybe we start off an inbound. Maybe we put a zipper into it. I don't know. And, and then can they do the same ABCs that we looked at off the setup, but now with more of a load on the working memory? And there are unlimited things you can do on this. Um, I have, so I have these PDPs for the players we're working with at college. It's been really fun introducing these. And you can use for each dynamic start you can tailor make it for whatever your players need to work on with their pdps so say for instance this is a pdp right here and it's got all his goals for the month etc cetera, etc cetera. 
Now say that maybe he struggles with pivoting against pressure. If there's a pressure defender to make a space pivot, or maybe he struggles sealing off an inbound, or maybe just getting the ball across the half to a spot on the offense. He find it diff difficult dribbling against pressure. I will use that. Whatever they need is the dynamic start. So that can mean in a practice, maybe we have three or four different dynamic starts, but it's really tailor-made to whatever that player needs to get better. And then you can see in this frame on the right, going to a 2v3, which I really like. So maybe if we say, or say we go off a zipper, X4 after screening then becomes a defender and smile. So then we got some more decision-making, making it tougher. Now that's some of the setup stuff. Switching now to static one-on-one, looking first just a speed advantage. Um, and this is just the blow by. So this is kind of an on-contact decision. If one's coming off, if they've got like a big speed advantage, they're a great uh, soloist, so to speak, they might wish to go. They might also, uh, they may also wish to reject the switch, which, uh, which Ryan showed in terms of going away from the direction that the switching defender is coming from. Now, how I would typically teach this is have two one-on-ones at the same time. And it's really important, I think, playing, having guards play against bigs and vice versa. And I think a lot of time in practices, that doesn't happen. And it's, it's really, really important. Ryan mentioned it with the Mayday stuff, but it's really important to put players in those situations. So I would have, obviously, the one going against the five and then a second one-on-one -on -one for, for the five-man. So he might roll, post, whatever. Uh, and it also, just having two one-on-ones go at the same time, it's great for developing spatial awareness. Now looking at some of the boomerang stuff. This is typically... How I'm going to start is with, with the blast cut. So the blast cut is a cut from a double gap to a single gap. And this is why it's so important that, you know, for the youth coaches on here, U12, U14, the boomerang action is essentially a blast cut. So being able to teach dynamic one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's critical. Again, a lot of great stuff from Canada Basketball on that and from Mike. So you can see just if you want to go to a dynamic start, it could be as simple as having the players – uh, under the basket and two could dribble to either 45. So it's a little bit more random. They don't know where they're going. And then three is going to go to the opposite 45. Now we're imagining this is the situation where the switch has happened. So we've drawn the switch. So then we're just going straight into the boomerang. Um, typically I would start with the context, but I'm just giving you guys the, some more ideas on, on dynamic starts. So what we got is two is going to shorten that pass, boomerang it, then get back out to space. And then they're going to win the race with a blast cut and then use that speed advantage, punch the gap, attack X5. And key on this is just like Ryan said, if, if the ball just goes straight back and there's kind of no, you can just create, if, if it's a situation where the player is just going on a static one-on-one -on -one after, probably means the boomer hasn't been that effective. So we really want that, we really want to emphasize that speed. And we, and we just talk about use some external cues like, Imagine you're driving out of the races, you're, you're Usain Bolt, whatever, win the short race. So I would do this guided X5. So on, on the frame left, you can see X5 is slightly late. He's trailing that inside hip. So player two is just going to blast, keep their, we, we, I talk about players keeping their momentum like a steam train without coming to a stop. And there's going to spike that ball and go. X5 will try and recover. Option B is X5 will uh, do a failed denial. They get their late, late denial. So option player B is going to receive it on that blast, cross back opposite, and then it's, it's one on one. Option C is a gap. So that's a shot decision. And then option D is overplay deny. Now, obviously I'm showing you guys all the options, but the ones you do depends on the group you're with, what they can handle, et cetera. This is some of the video for it. So I'm not doing this with the, the dynamic start. This was a static start on this. You can see I'm just playing guided defense to help introduce it. And these are some of the reads. I wasn't contesting the shots on this. This was a pretty long day. And you can see even just simple things, just constantly having to make decisions, it can be quite a, quite a mental load on, on the players. Now, you can see all the reads right here. And what you can see here is a good example of getting back out to space. And this is all that, you know, Ross McMahon's dominoes rule number three, into space, out to space. But in this context, it just gives that double gap and it gives them a chance to win that race. Now, I will show this one after. Okay, error detection. Something you'll see a lot with this is exactly what Ryan spoke about. That's created no advantage whatsoever. 
So that's why that outer space is really important. And then also just having this player look inside at the role man to soften up this defender. So then that blast is even more unexpected. Boomerangs were a runway. So this was the Tony Parker action uh, Ryan, Ryan showed us. I'm just throwing this with a boomerang. And this is kind of like off a stampede. So similar, but it's not, not the same. And now also this is guided too. So you can see just working on, the, on, on that runway, stampeding the catch. Now you can see in the next clip, I think it's the next one. What I did is we, the first few reps, just, just to get comfortable with it, but very quickly, what I did, uh, it's not on this one, was I loaded it in. So after screening, this defender now goes to the smile and they get to work on contesting, getting vertical. So now it's primary read, secondary read. So you guys are seeing, you saw quite a few uncontested reps there, but I get through that very quickly, especially if they can do it. And then I give them some type of extra decision at the rim. Halftime break. Any questions so far, Mike? Um, yes, actually, we have two. Um, one was in the um, in the chat in general. It was actually for both Ryan and Alex. So, Alex, let me go with you first. Do you see less snaking because it jams up off, uh, jams up off ball concepts and spacing, or is it a, uh, still skill or action that coaches put a weak side action to when it occurs? About no. I I'm not sure I understand that, Mike. So, um, do you see less snaking because it jams off-ball concepts? I think that's the first one. I don't know. I think you can still you can still like go scout and stuff with a snake. Like the Mavs do that a lot when you get snaked towards. So, I don't think necessarily. I don't know, Ryan, if you say anything on that. Yeah, I mean, I I think a lot of teams are are still snaking. Obviously depending on the coverage, you know, I mean, obviously against a drop, you see it all the time, especially, you know, the Celtics score Todd screen, the big off a drop uh, and snake. But I mean, I, it's predominantly obviously against ice and drops that, that you see it, but I think it's very common and uh, different things you can do to, you know, to complement the snake. That's like a whole new, whole new clinic. On yeah. The yeah. Yeah. No, oh. not going into that one. So, <laughs> Um, I got one he sent it to me personally. On the boomerang, we often see that players uh, flare away instead of uh, going towards the passer. Do you work on this as well? So where, where does the boomerang guy catching the ball? Does he catch the ball when he's flaring away? So creating a bigger distance between him and the passer before attacking? Or do you want him to run into the ball into the passing lane? Well, the one I showed was with, with the blast cut where he's using his speed advantage to go. What I will show is what Ryan showed where we, where we drive it to get that, get that big like stunting or helping and then creating the long closeout. So uh, there can be different types of things you do on the boomerang. You could blast cut, you could make a runway, you could hold, let the player drive it, create the closeout. So there are some, there are some different options you can do on it. No, perfect, man. There were the only cool. two questions right now in the chat, so... Great. No, that's good, man. Um, so now, just moving on. So obviously, next next load, small sided, would be going 2v2 on this. You can get a second ball in, have a multiple one-on-one -on -one with the with the five-man playing against the, uh, the X1. Sorry, yeah, on, on the switch. Um, now, this is the concept we uh, that, that Ryan showed, which I just mentioned. And it's really important to link in previous things um, to ensure retention is there. So say, for instance, maybe you've done the setups. Well, you could also encourage the setups here. And if we're keeping points, maybe it's a compete drill. If they get a chance to reject, maybe it's worth twice. So they're looking for that reject too. Then if it's not on and the switch is drawn, then they're going to the boomerang. So that's just a way we can interweave, create more random practice, and ensure things get retained. Um, and you can see this is what it is here. This is just off the boomerang driving it, getting that big to stunt or help, and then creating that long closeout. Now here I'm just getting the guys used to that movement. And the technical skills here are critical. And this is where I really think that modern player development is giving players combining tactical things with what we consider to be traditional skill development, like finishing, reading closeouts. Because for me, it has to have a context. And you can see just how much skill they're getting here but at the same time, working on closeout decisions, good stampede off the catch. And for me, this is critical. And I think so much of modern skills training, unfortunately, we're just focusing on very 
linear things, movement patterns, and we're really missing a big chance to teach players tactical things and really help them learn the game. Now, this is what, what I said about just adding in that, that defender. So now they get that decision right there. He's a seven foot two guy. So that's obviously a, an individual constraint, which leads to some, a lot of different things emerging. Um, ghost screens. So this was like the Mayday stuff. I would, I would start actually just teaching ghost screens and that slip out before getting onto the Mayday. I would typically just do this two on two live and you'll see what happens is a, you know, that Ryan spoke about the no screen, no scheme. So players typically when they're seeing this the first time, it's pretty tough to guard and you just see so many situations emerging. Maybe two could go on the go screen and open up that drive like you just saw. So I would typically just teach us live and also get the players used to that movement because it's quite a different motor pattern. And then what you can do if you want to work on closeout reads, something I do a lot now is use a ghost screen as a dynamic start into a closeout read. So the options on my closeouts, it could be option A, short closeout shot, could be run off the line, could be a flyby. So when we get to work on all these different reads too, but using the ghost as a dynamic start, you can see there just footwork. Even though these are really high level juniors, this is new stuff, cognitive load. So obviously stepping in there, talking about watching his feet. Now that was neutral. So very quickly, if it's neutral, we talk about, you see, you missed that decision. That's normal, that'll happen. But can we immediately reignite without lag? And now you can see they're immediately going into that second and we played with that reject worth double. So this is an awesome example of retention from what we just did still being seen within this concept right here. Finish up as the last one. So that's some of the ghost screen stuff. Then you can just get that into the mayday. Now, getting in some more dynamic starts. So I always coach, I like having my projector out so I can also use video. And I will typically just show them what the small sided game is and then they play. So this is just another example of a, of a start we could use. Then going out of, out of that. We were actually playing against a drop on this. So this wasn't against the switch, but um, obviously works works just the same. But on a really good slip there. And I think really, I think we got a lot of youth coaches on this call. Right? If you can teach this slip, it's critical. And I love the efficient source term terminology about the gentleman's stance. That's the biggest thing I think we're seeing in the modern NBA now where players open up their hips. We don't need to screen because there's already an advantage. And against the switch, against any type of coverage, the slip is something really effective. And I think for all the youth coaches here, I would really spend a lot of time focused on the slip because some of these things we've looked at today are quite advanced, I think. But if you can just get players doing this, it's really going to do wonders and it works really against any coverage. Um, so you can see just the wobbling, but that's perfectly natural. That's what comes from using some of these dynamic starts. Now, this is more of a randomized one. So this I call dominoes or neutral. So this player is finding his window, breaking three in a row to receive it. And I'm hiding the carrots and the spaghetti sauce. So this player has to make a one hand kick out off the dribble. So we get some more development. Now, if it's an advantage situation, if it's dominoes, we're just playing and now into post reaction on that wheel under, finding a window, et cetera. So you can see that even something, these, these guys are like pretty high level players in Italy, pretty high level youth guys, but still it's, it's not necessarily as easy as it seems. Now you can see I turn my corner to look. So this is some of the cutting action, the ghost cuts, which Ryan, you know, I think the term is slightly different, but I call, I call that ghost cut. Got that from Mike, when you disappear, appear again somewhere scary. And I always like, having the players involved. So even if it's not their shot, this player has to track the ball and get an alley-oop. It's fun and it just keeps them more engaged if it's not their turn shooting. Now, this is the bit I want to get to. What happens if it's neutral? And here I did this off a gets action, but this could just be a pick and roll. And now you can work on those same concepts. It could be uh, the, the setup, could be the looking for the, for the go screen, slips, whatever it is. I did this off the get. If I had an extra player, I would, I would do this 2v2. But if it's, if it's a two-on-one like this, you can still create a great workout, but you've got to, just got to be prepared to, uh, to step into it and give those guided reads. Now, something else I love for a team practices um, is the surprise drill. And I do this for pick and roll too. And the reason I'm showing this stuff is because these are examples of more randomized dynamic things because what we don't want is to have 
just have one, say it's a pick and roll drill because the players know what we're working on. So we want to disguise it and see, can they retain those things when they have other things to remember? So he's starting blind. He's going to turn and it could be any situation here behind them. I have a menu to make it efficient. So the team that's waiting, they will always be on defense first and I give them the letter. Right now with our U16s at college, we're playing with about 10 options, which is awesome. You can also just make them remember it. So you could say, all right, these are your the next options, the next five options you have over the next possessions just gets them used to retaining info. And you can see here, instantly, he's got to make a decision. Here, it's a whip it pass with this defender in a deep support position. But he saw it a little bit late, but still, now we're applying Domino's principles. Nice ghost cut there, we're just playing. There, we gave up Domino's immediately. So it's that drive, looking for cutting reactions. So we had a nice ghost cut right there. We had a trap right there. And you can do this with pick and roll. So my whole point is if, if you like some of these reads, also do it neutral, play off a of pick and roll and see, can they retain some of those concepts with all this stuff? I'm gonna skip that. Now, Battleship, this is one of my favorite games. And no matter what age the players are, they will love this. Um, and let's just take some of the things we've looked at today. So you can see on the left of that table, I've got the strike items. What this game is, is just like the game Battleships, players have to score using the different solutions that we've looked at. The defense can use, you can constrain them with coverages. You can also determine what location the offense uses to score. And basically the game is the first team that scores completing the checklist wins. And they have to retain this info. Uh, and it's great for pros, they love it too. Um, because they've got to remember this as they're going and they've really got to connect, communicate. And also defensively, if they know that maybe one team has only one boomerang score left before they win, well, they're going to really disrupt the hell out of that boomerang and the offense has to adjust accordingly. I give each team from Call of Duty, I give them one reveal the map. So then if they forget their scores, they can have a quick look, reveal it, etc. I also load in my transition immediately. I spoke with Mike today. Mike McKay, I think Mike on the last call, he spoke about this with transition stuff. So important to get the players thinking, what is the next action? And a lot of the stuff I showed you today, just on the 2v2, 3v3, often it will not just stop on the shot. We will get maybe, maybe if it's a two-on-two, -two, the defense has to get the ball to the half line and score a touchdown because we immediately want players matching up, applying trans-deep concepts, whether that's where you're tagging up coach or you do something else. It's so important. And with battleships, you can get those trips in really easily. Um, you can just play it with three trips. Flow back to EA. I think, Mike, you make a, an appearance in this one. I miss you, man. So this is, we were playing battleships with some of our guys. So what happens is we determine the triggers. And then we mark it where the score is from and what tool they used. So, again, encouraging them to be super creative with their reads. Uh, I saw a couple of EA players on this call. Hope miss you guys this was a great game we played so i hope you're still having fun with it um just to finish off so these were some of the the terms i used in this presentation so i think just having an awareness of blocked versus random is really important and can we teach all this stuff while interweaving as opposed to just focusing on one specific skill now i'm not opposed i'm not against block practice blocks can be very useful but i think so much of the time especially with the traditional approach of coaching we just go and we're blocked straight away and all the evidence and science shows us that it's a random practice which leads to transfer. I spoke a lot about constraints and specifically with pick and roll, it's this triad of constraints which lead to the skills emerging. And you can see that individual environmental task, and this is the whole idea of ecological dynamics, the individual constraints. And it's as coaches, we've got to have an awareness of this because it's all these which lead to different skills emerging. Say for instance, the size of a player, if players only play against the same defender or against the coach in practice, it's not game-like because it's not the same as what they have in the game. So I like just mixing up players a lot in practice, both in the pick and roll. Obviously, it's critical to know who you're playing with. Maybe it's a, maybe you're, as a screener, maybe you've got a fast roller or a slow roller. Maybe your defender's different. Maybe if, if, you're, if you're like a smaller guard coming off a screen, you've got a bigger guy switching onto you, that's going to take away some different skills. So it's really important to know these, especially the mental stuff. I think that's a big one on pick and roll, maybe. Especially when it comes to a game, if a player makes like two, two wrong decisions, 
what's the next thing going to be that really, really, that's a constraint which affects the offense and what's happening. These are just some environmental constraints. Now, these we don't have as much control over, but the task constraints are the ones which, which I've spoken about the most today. And these are things like the aim of the activity, the equipment used, i.e. whether it's two basketballs in the drill or one, the size that we play in, time and score, the coverage used, scoring system, player numbers. And it's this manipulation of these constraints which leads to the skill, as opposed to just playing in a decontextualized environment by doing a lot of on-zero stuff. Now, just some considerations to finish off. We've shown, you know, the stuff Ryan showed was, was incredible, like incredible. And as coaches, the challenge is, is the Goldilocks theory too much, too little? What, what can you take from this which is just right? And for a lot of youth coaches, maybe that's only two tools. But if you can do two of those things really well, then you're going to be effective. And what we want to avoid is that situation on the left where we just overload our players. And I've been very, very guilty of that. I, I did that last week in a practice here where I just get way too much stuff. And we've got to be very careful with, with the cognitive load because even just practicing in this way, it's very different for players. Then a lot of the time, just from my experience, players aren't used to making decisions like this constantly throughout a practice session. Final thing is just some implications for player dev here. I think number one is just allowing more self-discovery and wobbling in workouts and encouraging that. Number two is this idea of positional pairings as opposed to positional divisions. I got, I got this idea from Sefru Bernard. He calls it complementary pairings, I believe. And it's basically the idea that we traditionally see a lot of players split into positions when they're doing workouts. But the reality of the game is, especially on all the stuff we show today, it's typically the bigs playing with the guards on two-man actions. And therefore, as opposed to separating them, it's really important they actually play together and develop understanding playing together. Number three is just moving away from rigid checklists and using more constraints-based things as opposed to having a like checklist of moves. I think it's very important, though, as a coach, to have your packages, like Ryan spoke about. That's critical. But then seeing if... It, you know, exploring other ways to, to put it in and being flexible with it and really using stuff which meets the needs of your group. Obviously, that's the most important thing when you choose these solutions. It's got to make sense. You've got to know your players, see what works for them. I think more small group versus individual workouts. Really in the small group stuff, it allows all that decision-making to happen. Um, and then the, some of the PDP stuff I spoke about where, where you can use that as your dynamic starts. I think that's a really nice thing to do to lead to some great player dev that's it from me um big thanks to to everyone for joining today happily take any questions that's also my my instagram handle if you just want to dm me with anything uh from today thanks mike for organizing yeah no problem and thank you ryan thank you alex let's just uh keep us going for for one more minute so we uh, might have some questions in the chat uh, i believe all questions in the chat have been answered so far um i do get a private question in the chat if i'm um uh oh that's about another topic nope that's not about this one um no i think we have all we have everything covered i, I man my head honestly is blown away by all the ideas i got from seeing you you guys showing so much about this topic um Alex, I got a private message uh, saying, would you mind sharing the Bonzu ID again, please? Or where we can find it? What was that, sorry, man? The, the Japanese Bonzu ID. Uh, you can just Google, so Bansho, I'll type it in the group for everyone. It's really interesting. Um, let me just type it. And I just want to say a big thanks to everyone. Um, you know, especially I saw some people on this call who I've taken a lot of ideas from. Zico, Ryan, obviously taken a lot. Mike. So, uh, you know, big thanks to you guys for, for all the inspiration and stuff with this stuff. So, yeah, with, with that perfect words, I want to thank you both once again for, for joining and, and sharing your ideas. I know, it is, guys. I'm yeah, I know it's Friday night. <laughs> night. No, Ryan, Alex, both, thank you very much. Um, for everybody else, next week we have some other great speakers. Um, and yeah. The upcoming weeks will continue these talks as we are still in lockdown here in Belgium, the Netherlands. So I will be hosting uh, more every week. Great stuff. Thank Thanks so much, Mike. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Great job, Alex. guys.